Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carvel and I'm Al Hunt. This week our guest is the former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, renowned investment banker, and founder and senior chairman of Evercore, Roger Altman. Remember, we love to take your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. James, we have uh, a lot of election politics to cover, but that seems almost irrelevant when 19 little children and several teachers were killed in a fourth grade classroom by a gunman in Udalvi, Texas. You know, mass gun violence is commonplace in America now. Uh, typically, uh, you know, we saw it in Buffalo, uh, Buffalo Market last week. Before that, uh, several years ago, Parkland High School in uh, Florida. Several years before that, Sandy Hook Elementary School. Before that, uh, Cuyabine. Uh, and the sad reality, I believe, is that nothing is going to change. The power of the gun lobby and the ill-informed members intimidate politicians. I just, today, you know, when this was all happening yesterday, Ted Cruz, even while some of these children were dying, they weren't even, they hadn't even gotten to the hospital yet, assailed Democrats for advocating gun control. Cruz is just a craving coward. Mitch McConnell said he was heartbroken, not heartbroken enough to do anything about it. And Marco Rubio said, there's nothing we can do about it. I, I, I want to require, if I could, Cruz, McConnell, and Rubio to listen to the Golden State Warriors coach Steve Kerr, who before a big game last night discarded all of his basketball remarks and instead made this passionate plea. Um. I'm not going to talk about basketball. Nothing's uh, happened with our team in the last six hours. We're going to start the same way tonight. Um, any basketball questions uh, don't matter. Um, since we left shoot around, 14 children were killed 400 miles from here. And a, and a teacher. And in the last 10 days, we've had elderly black people killed in a supermarket in Buffalo, we've had Asian churchgoers killed in Southern California, and now we have children murdered at school. When are we going to do something? I'm tired. I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences to, to the devastated families that are out there. I'm so tired of the, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm tired of the Moments of silence. Enough. There's 50 senators right now who refuse to vote on H.R. 8, which is a background check rule that the House passed a couple of years ago. It's been sitting there for two years. And there's a reason they won't vote on it, to hold on to power. So I ask you, Mitch McConnell, I ask all of you senators who refuse to do anything about the violence and school shootings and supermarket shootings, I ask you, are you going to put your own desire for power ahead of the lives of our children and our elderly and our churchgoers? Because that's what it looks like. It's what we do every week. So I'm fed up. I've had enough. We're going to play the game tonight. But I want every person here, every person listening to this, to think about your own child or grandchild or mother, or father, or sister, brother, how would you feel if this happened to you today? We can't get numb to this. We can't sit here and just read about it and go, well, let's have a moment of silence. Yeah, go Dubs, you know. Come on, Mavs, let's go. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go play a basketball game. And, and 50 senators in Washington are going to hold us hostage. Do you realize that 90% of Americans, regardless of political party, want Background check, universal background check. 90% of us, we are being held hostage by 50 senators in Washington who refuse to even put it to a vote, despite what we, the American people, want. They won't vote on it because they want to hold on to their own power. It's pathetic. I've had enough. You know, James, then they say it's not about guns. It's about mental health. Of course, it's about mental health. It's about both. 
As President Biden noted, other countries have similar mental health challenges. They just don't have massive gun murders. Well, there's actually an explanation for it. In, in 1994, the Clinton-Biden crime bill, actually had an assault weapons ban that expired in 2004. Of course, the Bush administration and the Congress de decided in its wisdom not to extend the assault weapons ban. The math is very simple. How many assault weapons did you have in the United States in 1994? And how many did you have in 2004? And how many you have now? You can do the math. It, it's about mm -hmm. mental health. The, the, the courts have struck down large parts of states. Brady Bill barely enforced it. You had all of those sort of checks against this. The, 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 the truth of the matter, and I, 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 it, it's frustrating to say, it's not going to make a shit. Because in, in the Democrats, the Republicans will go, they'll lie. They'll get the NRA get money. They have the convention in Houston. Trump is speaking to half. They don't give a shit. And Democrats are not going to vote. And it's going to get worse. You had, a, you had a solution. And all we did is sit there. You know, we'd done something. And, done, you know, President Biden, President Clinton had done something. By the way, if anybody wanted to look at the crime rates between the time the crime bill passed and the last year of the Trump administration, I, I invite you to do that. Put us on, I mean, I, I think what Coach Kerr said was, it was elegant and passionate and true and moving. Unfortunately, it's going to change anything. I, 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 so, it, you know, people were hunting in 1998. They, they really were. They, they were going to gun clubs and they were practicing marksmanship and everything. They had something, we had something this country was working. When, when we unearthed the errors of the Bush 43 administration, we'll be digging for eternity to see how bad it was. Yeah. Um, this is such a tragedy, James. I was yeah, watching I don't know what you do now. I'm going to do any good to ban them all. There's so many of them out there. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. Well, it would help. I mean, this 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 deranged killer purchased an assault weapon, an A15, uh, just yeah. weeks I, after his 18th yeah. birthday, uh, and and maybe he could have found it elsewhere. I'm not sure. If it stops one, if it just stops I mean, if one, gotta get, if you don't have to see that. I would. I'm not. I'm for it. Don't get me wrong. Right. I'm just saying we had. Our, no, no. I know you are, but I was. Right. And, and it would have made a difference. I, I, I was watching television uh, Wednesday morning, and the, about the third time they showed the pictures of that little kid, I just started to cry and had to stop. It is so tragic. It is so sad. And one thing I will assure you, James, there will be more. More children will be murdered because we won't do anything about it. Of course. It. It, it, and it will see stories, you know, about Democrats don't want to vote. I, I I don't you know I'm I'm beginning to you know maybe it is just so depressed by this, but man if if you see what they doing what this court is doing the way they treated this Justice Jackson if you see this Buffalo you see this thing in Uvalde in South Texas it, it, you see the, the this leaked Supreme Court opinion you know if that doesn't motivate you I don't I don't know that there's I can think of anything else. If, if you're not motivated to vote, if you're not motivated to donate, if you're not motivated to do something, I actually think you're probably a shitty person. And maybe we got too many shitty people in this country. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really beginning to think that. And, and, well, you can, you know, you need a slogan. Okay, we'll try to get a slogan. We'll try to get a sound bite. But, boy, if you're looking at this stuff, if, if this doesn't, you, you know, you take a look at Ted Cruz and you say, you know, I think I'm going to not vote and give that guy more power because that's what you're doing. <laughs> if you don't care. That's, that's just what it is. You, you're signaling your approval, and he kind of knows that you don't give a shit. You know, he knows that you're going to hoof high and whop and say this and how depressed we are and how terrible it is. And you just go about diddy bopping around doing things the way you've always done them. And, and things are going to happen, and they're going to happen in the future. We actually had really addressed this issue. We'd addressed it successfully. And we just let it go. And that's the p price you pay for bad policy. Horrible policy. It's, it's you know, I, w I uh, wish I, I had hope, a, uh, uh, some kind of a more different thing. 
You know, I hope but, you're wrong. I fear you're not, uh, but I hope you're wrong. But if, again, if given all the events of, of given Donald Trump, given his lies, given that leaked Supreme Court uh, 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 likely verdict, and given what happened today, if Democratic voters want to stay home in November, uh, they'll get what they deserve. They'll get what I, I you're right. Now, I, and and they can say, well, we we didn't canvass enough, or you know. We didn't have a good enough message. and I mean, I'm sure all that's true at some level. But basically, you're just signaling your tacit nonchalance. I'm not saying you're signaling your approval because I don't think that. I think that's too much. You're just kind of nonchalant about kids getting murdered left and right. And, you know, you look yeah. at. You know, even you look at this, the COVID response. I mean, you, you get what you you get what you want. You two two point three times more likely to die if you live in a Trump county than a than a Biden county. I don't know if you don't. You, you, we don't care. I I I I, I can't. Uh, it, you you just wait. You, women's health issues. Oh my God. And but the environment. You know, we've been Australia. They had an election where climate was front and center. You couldn't get five votes in the United States running on do something about climate change. People, I don't know, they're not motivated. The whole freaking place is on fire. But the last thing we're going to do is vote. And, you know, there'll be all the rural whites will be out and flocking in droves. And I guess that's going to happen. Well, there were uh, a number who did fl uh, flock in droves yesterday. They were uh, Tuesday, rather. They were major uh, uh, primaries. And the theme among the sub establishment Republicans is that Trump suffered major setbacks. Oh, shit. Uh, I fear that's, in, that's, that's an exaggeration of hope. He embraced two stupid candidates in Georgia who were beaten by two very conservative Republicans. Governor Kemp and Secretary of State Raffensperger. They, had, they did refuse to help Trump steal the 2020 election in that state. But also, let's not forget, uh, in that in northwest uh, corner of that state, that Trump-supporting, hate-mongering Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, hey, you know, easily won nomination. But the one that just fascinates me, maybe more than any, was the Texas Attorney General runoff. And the state incumbent Attorney General, Ken Paxton, he's under state indictment for securities fraud and under a very serious FBI investigation as his own former assistants have accused him of bribery, he, by two to one, defeated George P. Bush of the Bush family fame. Uh, he had, uh, this guy Paxton had Trump's wholehearted embrace. George P. sold his political soul by embracing Trumpism. It didn't do any good. He was beaten by voters who saw the crook as more authentic. I guess he really, really is. Uh, and he he won in a route. So Trump is going to lose some, but sadly, this is still very much a Trump Republican Party. Trumpism doesn't lose very much, all right. And in, and in, in the, the the idea is that, well, if we move beyond Trump, we'll go we'll go back to John Heinz. <laughs> no, no, you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. oh, George H. W. Bush, you're not going to do that. It it the whole party is it. it it, in, I, I agree with Kathy Barnett, the, the woman in Pennsylvania. It, it's, it's about MAGA. It's not about Trump. And MAGA is as healthy as it's ever been. It's healthy as it's ever been. And if somebody comes in with a MAGA message, they'll vote for them. You know, it, 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 Trump is not the essential player in this. It's the MAGA voters that are the central player. And I think you, that's what you saw in Texas. You know, uh, Rassenberger ran as, you know, the, the only thing he wouldn't do, which was credible, and, which was good, that he, he wouldn't steal an election for Trump. But but he, he has a totally Trumpist view of the world. So does Kemp. And of, uh, and of election laws, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. Absolutely. And, you know, and, um, look at, you know. You used, you used to tease me, James, saying that I, you know, had an endless search for the um, for the good Republican, but I knew a lot of good Republicans. I didn't agree with them a lot of things. Howard Baker, George H. W. Bush, Bob Dole. You could disagree with them, but they were a different breed totally. MAGA really is synonymous with hate. That's what these people are. They are hate filled. There may be an exception or two, but not very many. Uh, they play the race card. Uh, they uh, they play the fear factor. 
And right. and they really are different than your father's Republicans. You know what? No, see, this is where I differ with you. And I'm not saying you didn't have. Yep. To, where I differ with you, it's not the politicians. It's the voters. The, the, the people who vote in Republican primaries are driving this behavior. I mean, if you just wanted to look at the greatest weathermane of, of the 21st century, look at Lindsey Graham. He wouldn't be, Lindsey Graham would be, be anything to stay in power. The reason he's at MAGA, because that's what the majority of the people in South Carolina want, quite clearly. They are, they look spineless because they're just following the dictates of the voters of their state. And, and also, they know that the Democrats are not going to do shit about it. They're just going to sit around and complain and, and, you know, talk just the same normal bullshit they do. But but until we get – I'm sorry. George Carlin was right. The public sucks. They just do. And, and we always think everything is, you know, top-heavy. If we just had one courageous Republican politician, well, look what's going to – Alan Kinsey was a courageous woman. He can't run for re-election. All the people that voted on that, they can't even run for re-election. It doesn't do, I mean, you can. It, it, it shows how spineless the audience got to sort of watch to go in some kind of a ideological pretzel. But they, 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 it's the less of what I call the less thematics question. He said, you know, the problem with Georgia prisons is the quality of the inmate. The problem with the Republican Party is the quality of the vote. Very low quality. Very, very, very low quality people but there's a lot of them well i don't surely uh you know of course that's the case uh, i would just argue and it's always been there it's nonsense to say it just began in 2015 or 16 but trump uh accelerated it uh he exacerbated it yeah uh, i mean 2008 and and 2012 we could have had a lot of objections to john mccain and mitt romney and we did but they were, again, a different breed than what we're seeing today. But, they just were. They, they, but they didn't run against anyone. What Trump did is he, he just ran full varnished, and people responded. They, they were already there, right? They were already there. And, and look look at how, how much better he didn't turn out in his areas, in these rural white areas. I, I mean, I, 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 he, lit an ex he, he lit the fuse on an existing bomb. Okay, we're with our economic oracle, Roger Altman. Roger, for the first time in 40 years, I hear and read talk of stagflation, sluggish economy and high inflation like we had in the 70s. Uh, is, that a, is that a serious danger? I don't think we're in danger of the type of prolonged stagflation that we saw in the 70s, which lasted four or five years, depending on how you measure it. But we are going to go through at least a, an interim period where growth will be slowing, which after all is the purpose of the Federal Reserve's change in policy, and inflation will be coming down at a slow and stubborn rate. But I do think that over <coughs> the next year and a half, we'll see inflation come down a lot. And while it's possible we could have a recession, keeping in mind that that's defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth mm -hmm. or six months of negative growth. I think we're probably going to avoid that. Maybe there'll be uh, a month or two or something like that of negative growth. But I think we're going to avoid a, a traditional true recession. And I think two years from now, inflation will be back to uh, let's, let's call them acceptable long-term levels, like 2%, which is the, Fed's, the Federal Reserve's goal. And there's no reason to think they, that the economy then won't be growing. How fast it's growing, I don't know. But it, So I don't see us coming, I don't see us re-entering the late 70s and early 80s, no. Well, that's welcome. But uh, all right, two years from now, inflation's down to 2% or so. What will it be in six months from now? Well, our forecast uh, at our firm 
is that the going out inflation rate at the end of the year, in other words, the rate uh, going forward will be 4% or 4, four to 4.5%. Four so it will not be back down to levels that we're all, we all would like, be comfortable with, or that the public will like. Um, it's just going to take longer than that. But by election day, down to probably below 5%, at least, better than 8%. Hard to tell because in any given month, the numbers can move around, you know, various, various uh, noise and the various types of noise in the numbers, for example. But uh, that's as good a guess as to where inflation will be on Election Day. Keep in mind that there's so many different ways to measure inflation. The Federal Reserve uses something called the personal consumption expenditure deflator, a lot of American, the American people generally look at the consumer price index. Some people look at core CPI, which is consumer price index without food and energy. But I think most Americans say to themselves, what's a ga gallon of gasoline going to cost? And what's a pound of chicken going to cost? Yep. Or groceries like that. Yeah. Roger, how much of our current inflation, which is not unique to America, it's, it's throughout much of the Western world, how much of it is attributable to the pandemic where with pent up, uh, you know, consumers splurge when we open up and the, and also the supply chain problems. And how much of it is attributable to uh, too expansive fiscal policies? Well, keeping in mind that the fiscal policy was a response to the pandemic, mm -hmm. the uh, pandemic was directly and indirectly responsible for all of it. But let's break that down. Um, what really happened, if we all remember so well, COVID erupted in March 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, very severely, and we had a national lockdown. And as a result, Americans were essentially staying home. And they were not spending money on several of the usual week-in, week-out uh, matters they spend on, like going out to eat or staying in a hotel or taking a flight somewhere. And so their, the spending side of their household budgets went down. At the same time, the federal government unleashed, as it should have, a giant monetary and fiscal response because initially the economy came almost to a halt after the lockdowns took place. And there was great fear that we were entering into a very deep and long uh, recessionary period. And as a result, those same American families staying home and not spending and seeing their cash balances go up um, also were receiving handsome checks from the federal government. The average, they, they, an American family earning $75,000 received, I believe, $7,600 all said and done through several different distributions from the federal government. So their traditional spending was going down. They were getting checks from the federal government. And after a couple of months of sharp fall, the stock market turned around and started going up very sharply. And ultimately, before very long, made all-time highs. So a lot of families, either through their IRAs or however else, were feeling flush for that reason. And so the American family, so many American families, obviously not everyone, were feeling uh, uh, cash rich. They had a lot of money. And they couldn't spend it again on some of these traditional things, so they started spending it on goods. Everything from bicycles to new cars to homes, every imaginable kind of home improvement, you name it. And prices for those, all those goods, consumer electronics, for example, uh, in face of this sharp demand, went up because the production side of the economy, not just for pandemic-related supply side problems, supply chain problems, just couldn't keep up with that demand. So prices went up. And they went up a lot. Um, anybody who tried to buy like a, a bike knows that. Uh, now, uh, uh, as we get pretty far out from that original COVID, uh, COVID outbreak, that type of demand is beginning to slow down. Used car prices, for example, have come off their peak. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the services side of the economy, which is fundamentally driven by, well, not driven by, but centered around wages uh, and, of course, service labor, 
uh, wage rates began to rise. And it's a good thing in many respects that they did. But wage wages, wages are running around 5% right now, year-over-year year growth. And obviously, that's not consistent with the 2% long-term inflation rate. And so the real challenge, medium term, is going to be, in terms of getting inflation back down, is going to be to cool off the economy generally, but in particular, wages. Everybody wants wages to rise, but it's not that fast. And that's going to take a while, because they've only been rising for a few months. There's a lot of momentum behind that with a 3.5% unemployment rate and with a lot of industries basically declaring that they're facing labor shortages. And so it's going to take, that's why I say it's going to take till maybe the end of 23 to get the inflation rate back to a level that everybody would be comfortable with. And that's the situation we're facing. James. Hey, so right, I want to amplify because you're talking about the thing that really interests me. And I, I read some of these financial blogs and stuff, and some people follow the Baltic Dry Index or some such thing as that, and others follow the difference between a yield on a two-year treasury and a 10-year treasury. The thing that I follow is the differential between the CPI and wage growth. And it looks like just, you know, back of the envelope calculation right now is the CPI is exceeding wage growth, maybe 2.3%, yes. call it that, right? And is there, by October, do you see any chance that that, becomes very narrow or it goes anywhere in, in favor of wage growth where people feel like they have something to lose or, or does normally is wage growth more sticky to, than other things? I well, by, by October, we could have a situation. Well, let me, let me step back a second. Right now, wages, as I said, are running at about a 5% annual year-over-year -year increase, but the most recent consumer price index figure was 8.5%. So the American worker including all of us, is going backward in terms of real wages. Right, right. Because they're giving up more on the inflation side than they're getting on the pay increase side. Um, by October, I think that, James, could have evened out. In other words, wage, wage growth could still be in that 4 or 5% plus zone, and inflation may have come down to the same general level. So workers are being at least held even rather than losing. Right. Um, but what, pub, what the public focuses a lot on, as you know better than me, is I said the price of gasoline and the price of certain basic groceries, like meat. Yeah. And, you know, uh, w global oil prices are really high. They're in the vicinity of today of 110. Um, and because of uh, a looming food, sh food crisis that we're beginning to move into, a lot of which is caused by the war in Ukraine, because Ukraine and Russia both have huge suppliers of basics like wheat. Um, it's hard to see meat prices and certain basics like that come down. But uh, I think there's a chance that in October, the wage increase rate and the basic consumer price index are about the same. So, but what I'm driving at is for this, I. If the Democrats have any chance to save off disaster, it'll have to be that voters feel like they have something to lose. And if, let's say it's even in October, the, the differential between the CPI and wage growth. I, I think if they will feel at, at some level, well, you know, it's a little better than it was five months ago. And if they think they could lose... Wherever it is, it, 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 it could lead to a different kind of voting behavior. That, that's my general point is, you know, always in, in politics or anything else, if, if you and I start the month with $100,000, at the end of the month, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, you have 100 and I have 110, well, I feel, uh, you know, it's what you would expect to get that, that, that people really, really get get to. So if they expect that things are, get, are starting to get a little bit better, they may be more reluctant to to make a change. At, at least that's the hope when you're yeah. trying to think of things to hope about. That Well, well I, I, I don't know if this answers your question, but if I were in the White House, um, first of all, I'd be talking a lot more about inflation than they are. 
about a week ago, Biden said that it was his number one domestic priority, quote unquote. And there have been a lot of things happen in the interim, including some terrible things. But I haven't heard much about that since. And even though it's hard for the executive branch to really fight inflation, that's mainly the job of the Federal Reserve, they've done a few things that they don't seem to talk about much, but are worth are worth talking about. You know, unclogging the ports, putting more truckers on the road, um, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, this new program to expand the supply of new homes. These are good steps that may take a while, but they're directed at fighting inflation. And if I were the White House, I'd be talking more about them and just talking about how every morning I wake up and I think about what I can do today about getting inflation down. Then by the time October comes around, and if inflation is indeed down from, say, eight and a half to five, they'd be in a position to say, you know, we're headed in the right direction. We've been working hard on this. Lot, 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 uh, we got a ways to go, but we're going in the right direction. So, so before I turn it over to Al, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that do focus groups. And it, it, what's kind of surprising is they blame corporate greed more than they do Biden. They don't think he's very effective to deal with it. But if you talk to, you look at a focus group says they see this as an opportunity to raise taxes. I mean, you you transition between both worlds. How, how much you think, how, do you think corporations are taking advantage of this atmosphere to raise taxes more than justified? And is there raise anything prices. to be done about that if they are? It's a really good question. Um, there are some industries which are very concentrated, like meatpacking, which the Biden administration has pointed out and is challenging in terms of the concentration there, right. where uh, the what I would call the oligopoly nature of that industry means that they may be raising prices more than their input costs are going up and taking advantage of it. But generally speaking, no. I don't think... Uh, I think businesses are primarily trying to stay even with inflation uh, and not try to take advantage of it and uh, gouge the public. Are there some examples of gouging? Yes, I think there are. Is it the main event? Is that what's really going on here? I don't think so. But um, it's hard to explain that to the public. Um I mean, for example, I think most people, most most of the public, doesn't really understand why gasoline is four and a quarter, or wherever it is at your local station, uh, four and a quarter, four fifty where I am, a gallon, and you know people think the oil companies are gouging them, and I'm not a student of the oil industry, and so I can't say that it's there's absolutely none of that going on, but and people always say that oil, uh, gas prices go up quickly and come down slowly. There's probably truth in that. But I don't think what's really going on in terms of gasoline is, is gouging because, you know, most most uh, populous parts of this country, there's four gasoline stations within within a half a mile. And it's pretty competitive. Right. Albert? Um, you mentioned the administration could probably do a better job uh, uh, articulating some of the good things they've done. But other than that, Roger, their options are pretty limited, aren't they? Yes, because uh, right now we have to cool the economy off in order to get demand down and inflation down, or at least the rate down, the rate of increase down. And that's really the job and always has been in the modern era of the Federal Reserve and monetary policy, which is why they've, they've, they've undertaken now such a change in monetary policy in terms of tightening it. Um, but I think medium term, some of these actions the administration is talking about are good actions and uh, are worth talking about, even though they're not nearly in the, as important or powerful as what the Federal Reserve is doing. Well, that's uh, let me ask you about the Fed then. Uh, you know, some critics charge that they waited too long to tighten. They did. Others charge they're tightening too much now. How would you grade the Fed? Waited too long. Uh, hard to understand why they waited so long. Uh, and, and, and really a low moment, I think, for the Federal Reserve, even though uh, two and a quarter years ago when COVID erupted, the Fed was heroic in terms of un uh, unleashing a huge 
multifaceted and somewhat creative response at that time. But this time, they waited too long. They let inflation get much too high. And as to whether they're tightening too much, the answer is no. After all, the federal funds rate, which is the rate the Federal Federal Reserve does control, so-called overnight rate, mostly affects loans between banks, is 1%. And by any historical standard, that's extremely low. They've just begun to tighten. They've had literally two interest rate hikes, federal funds rate hikes so far, one of 25 basis points, one of 50, or maybe three, maybe three, sorry. And the funds rate's 1%. There's no, nobody can look around and say, wow, that's too tight, because it isn't. Uh, at a 1% funds rate, the, f- the monetary policy is still supporting an expansion of the economy, not a restriction. So they have a ways to go before monetary policy gets really actually tight in the sense that it's constraining the economy. They're not even there yet. Roger, let me ask one more before I turn it over to John Maynard Carville to wrap uh, to wrap this up. I usually don't pay a whole lot of attention to the vicissitudes of the market. It's kind of hard not to after the last three months. Is it a leading indicator? Is it telling us anything? Well, I think it's it's it, 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 there are two principal explanations at a high level. One is when monetary policy is tightened, particularly after a long period of ease. Historically, it's bad for stocks almost every single time, simply because when interest rates go up, it pays people to hold various types of bonds, including short-term bonds, a little more than it did a month ago or two months ago as compared to stocks. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the whole purpose of of the tightening of monetary policy, which as I just said, is just beginning, is to cool off the economy and that will cool off corporate profits. And that will mean, just kind of arithmetically, uh, or should mean, uh, moderated stock prices or lower stock prices. I don't think it's signaling something worse than that, because stock prices were so high before, you know, as uh, three months ago or so before the correction started, and in some cases, hard to explain how high they were in tech sector, for example. So I don't think the, the, the turbulence in the stock market is saying, wow, we're headed into a do- long, dark economic hole. I think it's just a typical correction of the type that happens when interest rates start to go up after a long period of being low or zero, and where we're going to be facing a, a weaker economy than we've had, even though I don't think it'll be a disaster. James? So, so, Roger, this is the point that people are saying, well, just explain to us what is a basis point. If you say they raised a half a basis point, what does that mean to ordinary guys sitting there? Well, so let's take the mortgage rate. Okay. So the average mortgage rate in the United States about four months ago, five months ago, uh, and I think this is published by Fannie Mae, I could double right. check that, was 3% Okay, on longer term mortgages. Now, as of a week ago, it was 557, 5.57%. Okay. So, so the difference between almost- 3% and 5.57 in the way the market thinks of it is 257 basis points, with each basis point, as you can see, being one percentage, uh, excuse me, being a percentage of, of a full point increase. In other words, interest rates have gone from 3% to 557, the way the market talks about that, it's 257 basis points. It's 2.57 points, which is the way the basis point language right. works. Right. Okay. So, so if, if, it's, if, if, it, if it went from three to four, it'd be 100 basis points. 100 basis points. That's right. Right. Okay. Just, I just, <clears> so, the reason just that, so that the language is used so widely is because right. in, I, on an average day in the bond market, you know, bonds move by, no, mostly by very small amounts. You know, if you look right. at the 10-year treasury, which is the most widely followed bond, you know, an average day would be the 10-year treasury was 284, and now it's 287. Right. And so you have to have a fine-tooth comb to measure it, and that's where basis points come in. And, and th- 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 we're getting hit with a lot of basis points right now. <laughs> th- they're coming more over. And well, more most coming. people think the federal funds rate is going to get toward 
about 3%. As I said, it's about 1%. Maybe not quite that high, but we'll see. And so that's another 200 basis points from one to three, if in fact it gets that high. Um, so interest rates are going to go up further. There's no doubt, no doubt about it. No, I'm, I'm just like, want to go back to what, the, you know, of course, one individual d- taking one trip to one place hardly is indicative of anything. But man, I got to tell you, I went out to Los Angeles and if the airport is any indication of the economy, and I, I know that's a hard thing to extrapolate, it, it sure doesn't feel like negative growth out there. <laughs> I can tell you that. Well, we don't have, that's a good point, James. And by the way, um, I took the shuttle to Washington a couple of days ago and the airport was packed. I uh, couldn't move. From New York. I, mean, I was in New York. Um, but Same we don't thing have- with Boston. Now. We, we went to we, Boston. We're, we're, Same thing. We're still growing. We're growing right this minute, probably at about 2%, maybe a little better. So we're not in recession and we're not, we're not flat either. We're still growing. It's just that the rate of growth has come down some. Right. Well, like I said, it, I used to, you know, think about when I, what the airport was like in terms of what interest rates were going to do, but, but. It, that, but there's still a lot of demand out there that I can see. Oof, a lot. <laughs> well, yes, and we have a 3.5% un- unemployment rate, which will probably go down a little bit further. Um, and so, you know, by normal standards, this is a very good economy right this minute. And households are in decent shape, aren't they? Oh, very good shape. Household yeah. net worth is very high levels. Right. There were, I just um, saw the 2021 numbers, and, and they were, they were impressive. Yes, and um, uh, uh, you know, consumer debt is not at very high levels, so the household balance sheets are really in quite good shape. Um, and uh, even though retail sales right now are begin are weakening, and that's maybe one of the weakest parts of the economy right now, um, that comes after a very long period of very high retail sales. Right, but again. Right. The economy is still growing, and with the exception of inflation, which is a very important exception, it's in good shape now. Oh, right. I mean, thank you. Well, I, we've I think, certainly learned. Yeah, we have, uh, yes, we have learned a lot, and I think our listeners have. Thank you, Roger Allman. I actually feel a little bit better than I did uh, a half hour ago. <clears throat> so um, let's uh, let's let's hope it, it, it keeps getting better with that, and and I hope. We know interest rates are going to go up, but, um, you know, if we're not going to have a repeat of the 70s, uh, maybe in a year or two, we'll be in pretty good shape. Well, that's the goal. I feel like I'm watching a horse race and the CPI and wage growth, you know, <laughs> and like you know, wage growth is a little behind coming into the, <laughs> coming around the final turn, you know, and you're saying, boy, if you can just. <laughs> well, think of, think of, think of wage growth as rich strike. There you go. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. Rich, huh? 81 to like 1. 80, go, go. 81. I, love listening, I love listening to the replay of that race. I must have listened to it 30 times. Oh, I can't. They, I, was, track. I was in Las Vegas watching it. And I mean, you, 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 you just watching the people when it's happening, of course. Once it get, the horse made the move, and, you know, it must have been 200 yards for the finish line, you, you kind of knew he was going to win. And it, but it was just amazing. A lot of people lost money. A lot of people were happy. It was it was just it was such a it was such a moving thing. <laughs> well, what I thought was also cool was that the track announcer, the official track announcer, was so focused on the two leaders, Epicenter yes. and the horse, right. Right. that he didn't see Rick strike until the last second himself. Yes, right. yes, yes. And, and it was it, a it's an amazing. I had to watch the replay to see how that uh, Sonny uh, Leon, who had a great thing, yeah. to ask him what, what he what, what he thought about Trump. He said, "If I wanted to see a horse's ass, I'd have run second. <laughs> 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 well, when you watch that replay, when you watch the replay, which is the standard one, with about starting about halfway through the race, where there were fourteen horses ahead of Rich Strike, fourteen horses, and somehow. Through, I thought one of the best rides I've just ever seen, ever. Uh, and of course, the horse had a, a lot in the tank at the end there. 
It, it's just and incredible. I mean, I, I, I watch it, and I, I, I'm happy to watch it again. Me too. Is he going to run in the Belmont? Him. Yes, he is. Good. I mean, as of right now, he is. He, I'll yeah, tell you this. If take he does, he be an 81 take shot. Mo, bet Modonical in the Belmont. That horse is going to okay. win. Okay. Okay. Hey, Roger Altman, yeah, thank you. you got to get back to work. Thank you. We, All right, we guys. appreciate it. All it man. was terrific. Take, take oh, care. See you later. All right, James, now we have our questions. God, these questions are good. And, and it just, it, the thing that really, really bothers me is the ones we don't use because they're all so good. So keep, if we didn't, don't get to you this week, send them in again because we'll get to you maybe next week. All right, James, our first question is from Tom in Wendell, North Carolina, who says the minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour. This is a 9-11 emergency. Why aren't Democrats making more of it or some sort of deal to get it up? Make the Republicans vote on it. He also says he loves the show and he loves low carb magic spoon all the way. Well, he's got a good point. In, in, in 2020, they put the minimum wage on the ballot in Florida in a race that we famously did not do that well in. And it was a $15 minimum wage and it passed to 67%. This stuff is enormously popular. It helped people. You, I'm, I'm sure Cinema's been. They had enough contributions and she won't vote for it, but make them vote on it. Go on record. This is something that is wildly popular. It's are most things, almost everything the Democrats want to do. I, I am told that they're going to pass a billionaire's tax this summer. I'm told they're going to pass something to do with prescription drug benefits. I, I, you know, I was told other things that didn't turn out right, but these are reliable people that say this is going to happen. I, even if they don't pass the minimum wage, Put it on the ballot. At, at least, at least make them, make them deal with it. And yep. it gives you a, 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 a little bit of an argument here. But I, I, I think the guy is spot on. We know this is popular. We don't know it just from polling. We know it from actual voting in an actual state. It's wildly popular, as it should be. Totally concur. Sue in Cumberland, Rhode Island says the great replacement theory, the Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram nonsense, already happened when European settlers intermarried with the in, in, indigenous, non-white people of the Americas. Uh, I also would point out, Sue, that uh, when the Italians and the Irish and the Germans and the Polish were immigrating to America, there was a similar complaint made. You're really going to dilute uh, what this country is all about. That's why it's such total crap, if you will. So she, Sue wants to know, why can't the Democrats fight this ridiculous far right, right theory with facts? Uh, and I think you're right, Sue. Uh, if, if, you know, let people know that what this is is pure and simple racism. That's what it's all about. James? Well, okay, we, we, we start from a political point of view. All right, so and I've, I've seen this done a thousand times. So he said, I'm going to list your names of some, some groups of people and tell me if you think they were unfair about them. And you might go pro-life groups. They might go to the National Rights Association, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, all right, uh, Hollywood filmmakers, Right, immigrants. Immigrants score very well. People are very favorably disposed toward immigrants. And the way that they frame it is they're against all immigration, of course, what they don't like is to have total disorder. But I think the Democrats need to be very offensive about it, very much on the offensive. I think we have the strong hand when we talk about immigration. And I don't think we talk about it enough, not as stupid open border stuff, but, you know, once they say something that ignorant or silly, it, it, it pretty much drowns out the other message, but we, we should, like, push this. We fought for them great. What do you think is going to solve the labor shortage? <laughs> what do you think is going to solve the crisis in entitlements? Well, more people paying. I mean, it's... Day in and day out, man, I, I see immigration working in a very positive way for America. I really do. I'm very favorably disposed of it, and I, th I think it can be a winner political issue. I really do. Agreed. We have two questions, which I'm going to combine about Pennsylvania, uh, the chaotic Pennsylvania race. Greg, uh, who lives now in Aliso, Bahio, California, but it's via New Orleans, 
He, he notes that McCormick led an election night. The next morning, Oz passed him. Based on Trump's comments about rigged elections, doesn't this make all uh, this everything in this election rigged? Um, and so he's really looking for a comment on what's happening there. And David in Pittsburgh also asked about the really chaotic Pennsylvania race where you have a Republican race that isn't decided and a Democratic candidate who spent 10 days in the hospital. We're not quite sure what the status is. But um, I've never quite seen anything like Pennsylvania a couple of weeks after the primary, James. No, it, 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 you're right. It, it, I, I think that most people feel like if things go the way they are, that McCormick will probably end up with the most votes, but it'll take a long time. I, I, I was on television. And Lord knows what he may have to do to get there. Right. And I thought that, that uh, Purdue would get about 32, 33 in, in, in Georgia because that was what Trump was able to get for, for J.D. Vance and, and Dr. Oz. As it turned out, he, what, he got 23, 24? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, now he was running against an incumbent, which probably made some difference, but and that, that was a pretty stunningly low number there. In, in terms of Pennsylvania, you're right. I think Fetterman's going to have to, you know, based on the story that I saw in the New York Times, with that, and I know that reporter Gina Collada, and let me see another reporter with it, is a very good medical reporter. She's very good. She'd have been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I hope I, I hope he's better, and I, I hope he answers questions to get this behind him because it th- I think he's going to have to do it before it's over. And that he can get to just starting ripping and running in this general election. And, you know, the, the other big issue they have is Mastriano. They, they, you know, it's not like in, in 1988, the gubernatorial candidate. Yeah. candidate. You, you're not going to have, like you used to have, you know, massive number of people voting for Democratic, for governor and Republican for senator. That, that just doesn't happen anymore. And I, if it's a bad enough year, I hate to say this, I could see Mastriano getting to be governor of Pennsylvania, which would be a disaster on a level we, we can't even imagine. Oh. Uh, but oh. the Fetterman's got to got to tie him in there really hard to the whole operation, and you got you got to make if it's McCormick or even us, you know, you you have to make them answer for him in in many ways, and they're not, they're not going to want to do it. They're going to no. walk around in a fleece vest. I talked to someone who knows Pennsylvania politics, and they said they thought Oz probably got slightly more votes, but that uh, McCormick will steal it. And I said, why? I said, because he's hired everything. He's hired every high-powered lawyer. He's got a lawyer in every single county, and he's got some of the Trump thugs uh, working for him. But for Fetterman, the key is he's got to be transparent. He hasn't been transparent about his sickness. Maybe it's relatively mild, like he says, but he has to let us know soon what kind of health he's in. And if he's in good health, uh, he can win that race. Yeah. Michael, he just says, Michael, you know, I'm going to read your question, but I'm upset with you because you say, Michael, in the USA. Well, you got to do better than that. We got to know where in the USA. Uh, but Michael does ask a good question. He said, if not for Manchin and Cinema stopping uh, his, uh, his reconciliation, the, the Biden bill, we'd be in a different place. Why hasn't more been done to present the reality? Why can't Democrats capitalize on it was a lost opportunity, but it's not the president's fault? I would just add, Michael, also, why don't Democrats talk about what Biden has done? There have been some big things that have happened. I mean, the first COVID relief, maybe it was a little bit too excessive, but it helped a lot of people. The first infrastructure bill, major infrastructure bill that's passed in decades, and a lot of good appointments. Talk not about what hasn't been done, but what has been done. Well, Yes, and, and again, this is something that I have this fixation on. Is the biggest problem we have is Biden's number among Democrats. In the AP poll, it was 73. Trump gets, used to get 95 among Republicans. And the reason is, of course, Democrats are being told by other Democrats that Biden hadn't done that much. I still have confidence that they're going to have some major legislative accomplishments this summer. I know that they think they line up the votes and they think they have them. And it'll be on something that is wildly popular and that'll be like a minimum tax on billionaires. And it'll be something in the direction of making big pharma negotiate with drug prices. I, I'm sure it will be predictably criticized as not enough and too little, too late, you, you know, everything else. We've been talking about infrastructure since we built the interstate highway system. Right? 
It's the first president to ever get it done since Eisenhower. And, you, you know, we talk about it insufficiently or we act like it didn't happen. So I, I, they get these legislative accomplishments over the summer and it kind of people to refocus on the Biden record. And these people start shutting up about how Joe Biden hadn't done anything for you when he demonstrably has done a lot, just, not just for you, but for the country. Yep. The next question is a good question, though I'm not sure it's coming from uh, the you know the best um, the best place for this question. John in Sonoma, California, asks a really good question. He says many in rural America feel abandoned by the educated, with towns their towns devastated, and the post-industrial America. The Democrats answer with wonky policy, which you know actually probably would help, but there's no emotional fusion to contrast with the rage and despair. So what is the deep emotional message that Democrats need to make to those who are hopeless in turning to the MAGA rage? Uh, that guy has asked the best question or uh, observation in the history of this show or any other show. Uh, this is something that I've been on, for, uh, of course, but, you know, climate is the only major movement social or political that, that refuses to use any emotion. There's no song, there's no bumper sticker, there's no logo, there's no anything. And you're right, we have to, it, it is, and I, I thought this at one time, it, it, it is a just article of faith among Democrats that if you have good policy, you execute good policy, and you help people, that people will reward you by voting for you. That That is not true. That might be true a little bit, but not near as much as we think. And, and what they do is they connect a, a lot of hot-button emotional and cultural issues to keep on. People want more gun control. Don't kid yourself. People want women to have choices when it comes to the, the, the health care and reproductive health care. People want that. You know, pe people want taxes on the wealthy. People want to do something about big pharma, and we have to frame this, and we have to frame it in a way that people are culturally comfortable with it. And our, our listener is, is so right, and, and a lot of what comes down, you know, is people in San Francisco give the aura that they look down on people in Sonoma. And uh, I understand how you feel that way, I understand how your neighbors feel that way. And the, the party has become too responsive and too led by its overeducated white urban base. And that's a lot of the problem. And I, what I hear from your question is, is that observation that you're making from, you know, one of the, I think, most remarkable areas of the country. So it's certainly beautiful and the products they have out there are great. But Sonoma County is very rural. It's very agriculture, and I think what our, what our listener is saying is something that every listener to this show should pay particular attention to. Yeah, you know, spend time, well, spend time in a lot of these rural areas, but uh, I was in some in both West Virginia and, uh, and Pennsylvania, and Trump, uh, as awful as he is, he plays to their fears, he plays to their insecurities, he plays to the fact that elites look down on them, and they think he's one of them. Didn't do a goddamn thing for him, but uh, he's able. He's 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 conned them, and in part he's been more successful in conning them because of just what you just said. The Democrats, uh, not forfeiting, but just not really competing the way they should, not having the kind of messages they ought to have. So maybe it'll change. No, um, and we're way too attentive to the educated urban base. The final question comes from Shane in Minneapolis. Unless something terribly unexpected happens, when all is said and done, will Mitch McConnell have done more damage to American democracy than any other political leader? Close call, James. You know, I, you know, I don't know. What did Roger Taney tell me? I, I, you know, you, yeah. d d let's just say he's done a lot. Right. Uh, but look at the damage that George W. Bush did. You know, a war. Not to, not to mention Donald Trump. Trump of course. Yeah. Not, not even to mention Trump. Okay. I, you know, I, I don't know. But he's done a lot. And I, if you sort of try to kind of fight. By the way, he is by far less popular than Biden, Schumer, Pelosi, anybody. He is the single across the board 
most unpopular public official in America. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, they would make what they made into Hillary or Pelosi or, you know, people on our, or even Harris, uh, the whole office more substantially popular. I think anybody's more, pop, more popular than Mitch McConnell. But we've yeah. not been able to effectively and emotionally use him as a, a way to get votes. I thought maybe we'll think of something this term. I don't know. Yep. It didn't ever, why, why is every Democrat running for Congress, are you going to vote for Nancy Pelosi to speak? Well, every fucking Republican ought to answer the question. Are you going to vote for Mitch McConnell to be majority leader? I'd ask McCormick or Oz, whoever it is, right to their face. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Or House members, are, are you going to vote for Kevin McCarthy? Vote for Chuck Schumer. No, no. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. But, yeah. they, we don't, they just do that. And all we do, well, I'm going to look at a variety of things. Uh, you know, as a more cast ballot for leadership and, you know, who can do the most, blah, 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 blah. You know, it, it, it just oozes weakness. Oozes weakness. Good questions from New Zealand to New, to New Orleans to Sonoma uh, to Minneapolis. So keep them coming. Uh, the ones we didn't get to this week, we'll try to get to next week. Thank you, listeners, very much. Hey, James, now for the outrage of the week. These are, you know, mine, I confess, ahead of time is pretty tepid compared to some of the dreadful things going on. But, you know, it's still an annoying outrage. Kellyanne Conway, a Trump enabler, has published her memoir. I'll take a pass. There are important books I'm trying to get to. This isn't one of them. It was Conway who coined that Orwellian term, alternative facts. But I did read the account by that Star Washington Post reporter, Ashley Parker, and it's clear the book is self-serving. Now, that's nothing new. Score settling with the likes of Jared and Ivanka Kushner. You know, that sort of is nice. And really unseemly asides uh, about her internal family problems. But to me, the, the, the cruncher, the worst of all, was her claim. Now, James, I want you to listen to this. Her claim that Donald Trump is a feminist. He is a prominent feminist, according to Kellyanne Conway. Why? Because, she says, he elevated and supported her to, quote, crack the glass ceiling for women, end quote. You know, I thought that Madeleine Albright and Hillary Clinton and Condoleezza Rice shattered a lot more glass. Now, Donald Trump is no more a feminist uh, than I am uh, a cardinal or than the Pope is a Muslim. He has a long record, both professionally and personally, as a misogynist. And with this absurd claim... The Kellyanne Conway book appears to be written in alternative facts. Well, of course, everything you say is true. There's nothing to, obviously, I mean, my old rage is this stuff in the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, it, 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 Russell Moore called it apocalyptic. All right, Russell Moore was the biggest Baptist people of faith in, in the country. And it, when, when, what, what you were, you know, what, what, what Willie Stalker, Told Jack Bird, man is born in sin and conceived in corruption. The entire conservative movement within the Southern Baptist Convention, OTEC, was born, conceived in corruption, and born in sin. It was started by two people, one named Paige Patterson, another named Paul Pressler. I think Pressler was a judge. It turns out that one was a pervert. It seems that one's a pervert, was accused, and I think in a civil trial right now, for molesting a minor. The other was very, very tolerant of rape, and people came to him about this, and he told them not to let it go, don't bring it forward, anything else, and the whole plan for this was hatched at the Cafe de Mon on Decatur Street in the French Quarter in New Orleans, and it, it, was, it was something that was rotten from the start, and it's produced exactly the kind of rotten result when rotten people get together and institute rotten policy and put rotten people in to execute that rotten policy. And what, what everything that you see in is exactly what these assholes deserve. It is not what the, and these poor victims who, who were, you know, good people and they thought they were going along with something. A bunch of and perverts. They intimidated them and they threatened yeah, them. It oh. just, it's, it's, yeah. and I, you know, have I read the whole thing? No, well, I looked at see what Russell Moore and what's the other woman, Beth Moore, who's not related to him, 
Enoch Byatt has Death any more, sense right. of integrity. And Michael, Michael Gerson, there are some, yeah, 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 yeah there, there, there's some people I, who, I, 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 any, you know, there, there are many, 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 you know, decent people outraged by this. The problem is, is you can name the decent people on five fingers. <laughs> it's the indecent right. people that's the problem. Uh, I want to see what I want to see what Ralph Reed and Gary Bauer and others have to say about this. We got to hump some new accounts. I suspect not much. There's a lot of humping yeah. going on over there. Yeah, he was well, humping James, uh, the even, were up in the kids. Right, right. Yeah. They were, they were, they were, they were yeah. pro humping. Yeah, uh, and they didn't care about the victims. So. No, no, nothing to. What do you think? You, you don't think this is all bred out of the same? Psychology is the Supreme Court or the same thing that you, you're watching Ted Cruz in uh, South Texas now. It's the same shit. It's the same thing. And, I, you know, I don't know. I hope I'm surprised. Or maybe I'm just in a foul mood. But, man, we got some awfully shitty people in this country, I got to tell you. Shitty people. Well, we got more good people. The question is, what are the good people who are going to come out and vote and participate and uh, and voice their views? If they leave it to the others, uh, then they get That's what right. they deserve. But if history is any so. guide, they, they're going to stay at home. You know, they're going to shoot children and they, they're mm -hmm. going to, you know, rape, you know, congregants. They're going to do all the stuff that they're accustomed to doing. And we'll say, well, I didn't go up because I didn't like high gas prices. All right. That's just I got I got to get in a better mood here. <laughs> Let's do something else. You will, <laughs> you will. I know you. You will. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail dot com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.